good to see you. would love it if you would open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah 31. And then if you're really coordinated, you could go over to Hebrews 7 and hold your finger there, all right? Worship folder there somewhere. We're going to jump from Jeremiah 31 directly into Hebrews 7. You have been forewarned, okay? We're going to go one to the other. Be picking up in Hebrews again, like earlier this year. While you're turning to Jeremiah 31, we'll start reading here in a little bit from verse 31. Are you all familiar with the ministry known as the Prison Fellowship Ministry? Have you, have you heard of that before? Prison Fellowship was founded in 1976 by uh, Charles Colson, a former Richard Nixon aide who served a seven-month prison sentence for a Watergate-related crime. After Mr. Colson became a Christian, God used Colson's experiences in prison to help him form this ministry that within, thank you, got old eyes, lights help. <laughs> Helped him to form this ministry that within even a few years started to have international outreach. I first came in contact with it back in the 90s, like a whole lot of preachers and churches did, with a Christmas outreach that they sponsored named Angel Tree, in which kids would receive Christmas presents in the name of their incarcerated parents. The churches would give them, and then they would make it to the kids in the name of the parents that were in, in prison. Well, a man by the name of Thomas Lee tells a story about how some time ago, the Prison Fellowship Ministry sponsored a dedication service for a chapel within a prison in Georgetown, Delaware. Backstory is local churches had contributed uh, funds to build the chapel and volunteers and inmates had carried out the work. And when completed, this chapel seated 275 people and it stood in the very center of the prison yard. So surrounding this chapel were all these concrete cell blocks and razor wire that one would normally associate with the prison setting. Lee writes that the chapel represented God's invasion of a prison for the purpose of righteousness. It was an outpost of righteousness squarely in the middle of a place of punishment for lawlessness. I'm told that at this dedication service, the lieutenant governor of Delaware attended as well as several local dignitaries. During the dedication ceremony, the prison chaplain introduced several prisoners who had already received help from the ministry, including one particular inmate named Jim. Jim was serving life without parole. And he explained how the volunteers had cared for him, and he shared what Jesus meant to him. And the freedom that he had come to know in Christ, even while still living within the prison walls. A little while later, the group adjourned to a local Methodist congregation for a meal and an evening service. And this service celebrated a new community outreach in which five prisoners were furloughed to restore a senior citizen center in the home of a retired elderly couple. These furloughed prisoners had lived in the homes of community people during their individual two-week stints of, of work donated to the community. It was at this evening service that the inmates were allowed to share what this time in the homes of others meant to them. I say all this to build it up to this point, all right? What we have here are hardened men who would not dare weep in prison, all choked up as they explain how much it meant to them to live with, with Christian families outside of prison. During one man's talk, a little girl about six or seven years old got up and stood with and then took the hand of the prisoner who had lived in her home. It's kind of like he's mine.
No one nor anything before him had that capability. And that brings us to the message that we're going to be looking at a little bit later on in Hebrews chapter 7. That in Christ, God offers us a new way to be saved. A way that is not dependent upon human ability to keep commandments, but upon God's, hear this, but upon God's determination to keep his own promises. Smile, people. That's the best news you're going to hear all day, all right? Because I guarantee you, God is a lot better at keeping his promises than we will ever be at keeping his commandments. Amen? Please hear this. In Christ... God will do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Instead of trying to live up to his words, we will live by them. Instead of trying to, to gain our forgiveness, we will be granted it. Instead of being his subjects or even his students, we are invited to be his sons and daughters. If any of that sounds familiar to some of you, I'm not surprised. It's what God has always been working toward. Jeremiah chapter 31. Pick up in verse 31. You ready? The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. If you got a pen, pencil, highlighter, underline, highlight that new covenant. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is what the Lord says. Church that... That new day, that new promise or covenant has now come through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 7. Would you look at your Bibles, please? Hebrews 7. Find verses 18 and 19. And way to go, church. Almost everybody has their head down and the pages turning. So good job. Hebrews chapter 7. Pick up in verse 18. At the center of this new covenant, this new system, is a Savior. A great high priest through whose ministry we can at last draw near to God. Pick up in verse 18. The former regulation, we're talking about the Old Testament law, the, the old covenant promise, is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced, Jesus Christ himself, by which we draw near to God. You see, here is one, Jesus, who is able to do what no human priest could ever do. To secure our complete and eternal salvation. Jump down to chapter 7, verse 23. Now, there have been many of those priests, we're talking about those that served um, under the Old Testament law, the Levitical priesthood, okay, through the line of Aaron. We're talking about those. Since death prevented them from continuing in office, the old way. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, remember the rule about therefore, okay? Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. If that's not highlighted, highlight it, all right? I, I, I'll correct. That's the best news you're going to hear all day, all right? 
That's what Hebrews chapter 7 is all about. Now we're calling this message this week, Return to Hebrews, because as, as those of you who have been with us through this whole COVID time know, we started off this past year with a couple of months working through Hebrews chapters 1 through 6 because of the way that it elevates Jesus. We said something way back, I'm going to say a couple more times during this series. How our perception of who Jesus is, all right, how we see him, right or wrong, will dictate our pursuit of him. So we need to see him rightly, folks. How we perceive Jesus, high or low, will dictate our pursuit of him, and our pursuit of him is going to have a whole lot to say about our, the reality of him being in our lives and what, what, we, what we receive even right here on this earth. It's important we get Jesus right. It's really important that we get Jesus right. But when we got to, to Hebrews chapter 6, we found a rather stern warning that because of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ, those of us who turn to him were not to stay the same. There has to be necessary growth or change in our lives because of the work and person of Jesus. So we took a long time out to hold up the fruit of the Spirit as an example of what personal change, not just corporate, not just church, personal change was to look like and how it was to be expressed in our lives. But it all, and I mean all, comes back to the uniqueness of the person and work of Jesus Christ as the source and power in what Hebrews chapter 7 and following will show the very promise of whatever growth and change that will take place within us. It all comes back to the uniqueness of the person and, and work of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not sure I should have checked beforehand. I asked Dale last week to recommend to you all that you read Hebrews chapter 7 in advance of today's message. Did we get that message across? You were supposed to read Hebrews chapter 7. <laughs> but you're going, to get a, you're going to get a reprieve, all right? It was already built in. Um, the reason why I, you're going to see here in a minute, we're going to come back and revisit this again, all right? Because in the middle of all this, when you get into Hebrews chapter 7, stands this mystery figure from Israel's distant past that is known by the name of Melchizedek, okay? Got your Bible still open? Look at the end of chapter 6. We could go further into chapter 5, but look at the very end, last verse of chapter 6. And it's talking there, it's expounding on this hope that we have in Jesus Verse 20, who went before us and has entered on our behalf, talking about the holy place, the very dwelling of God. He has become a high priest forever, here it is, in the order of Melchizedek. Now chapter 7, verse 1. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and a priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything and then goes on, all right? That's what I want you to read again this week. In the middle of all this is this guy that's known by the name of Melchizedek. He just pop comes up in the middle of all this. And the Hebrews writer is going to make a big point of him. Now, why is this Melchizedek guy so important? He's not. Not really. He's only mentioned two times in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 14, and again a little bit later on in Psalms 110. And then all of a sudden, he's mentioned nine times here in Hebrews, and that's it, all right? Hebrews writer grabs him and just hangs on to him and keeps on holding him up here. Why is this Melchizedek guy so important? He's not, except that through him, through Melchizedek, we, please hear this, we might understand the uniqueness of Christ in a greater fashion. Melchizedek is what Scripture calls a type 
a shadow or a foreshadowing of what God was ultimately pointing to, the, the person and ministry of Jesus Christ himself. Melchizedek essentially becomes an illustration, or maybe better yet, a signpost to help us understand the uniqueness of Jesus to do what he was called to do. Chris and I got to do some driving around our great state here just over the last couple of weeks. You see a lot of signs, all right? I got, a, I got a son-in-law that loves the sign that has, says range cattle, you know. In Illinois, we don't have cows just wandering over the road, all right. So he, he, he likes it. We saw signs that, that, you know, had a longhorn sheep on them. We saw, have you ever seen a sign that says falling rock? Okay. Have you ever seen a sign that says, what's it, what's it say? Uh, historical landmark. Scenic lookout. How long are you supposed to look at the sign? Huh? You come up one that says falling rock. Do you keep reading the sign or do you look for what it's pointing to? All right? Melchizedek is the sign. Don't get caught up. Don't get stuck on him. All he's to do is to help point us to whom? Jesus. Jesus this unique one, the one that makes a difference. Now, almost every one of us, we get reading through chapter 7, and I think it's, it's at least six, it might even been seven times, it's at least six times this Melchizedek keeps on coming up, and it's just human nature to say, what? You know, who's this guy? Don't get stuck on Melchizedek. All he is doing is showing that he was different and Jesus is much more unique. He's separate. He is, he has become what God has called him to be able to do. Better than what was in place before, okay? So that's where we are. And I'm, I'm essentially going to stop right there today. Because too many people get stuck, they get hung up on Melchizedek, and he's just a placeholder or a, a signpost to someone greater, Jesus Christ himself. So we're, we're just going, er, we're stopping here today, and here's what I'm asking. I'm asking that each of you go back and you read Hebrews chapter 7 and 8 again for the first time. That wasn't a dig. That was just, okay. It wasn't. Anyway, with this basic understanding, all right, please, that what you will be reading this week was originally written to Jewish Christians. Don't lose that. Originally written to Jewish Christians who had come from a background, a tradition of the Old Testament law, a tradition of the Old Testament requires, a tradition of the old priesthood, the, the Levitical priesthood and the Old Testament covenant. That's what they were comparing Jesus to. And under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the writer of the book of Hebrews takes them back to an Old Testament historical figure, Melchizedek, in order to show these first century Christians that Jesus and his priesthood and his ministry and the promise that he brings with him is all superior to anything they had ever known. And that is still truth for each and every one of us gathered here today. That hasn't changed. So our assignment this week is to go back and read, study even Hebrews chapter 7 and 8, and look for, get your pens, get your highlighters, look for how it shows the superiority of Jesus to fully meet your and my needs in a way that no other possibly can. Now, when we get back into this together, I'm going to lead you through this. We're we're, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through it together. But this is an essential transition in the book of Hebrews. And it is needful for us to get it 
if we're to fully understand what God has for us here. And for you to fully get it on your own, it's needful for some of you to do the work on your own, all right? So, our assignment is to go back and read Hebrews chapter 7 and 8, mindful that was written to first century Christians with a Jewish background. And they were comparing Jesus to what they had known. And what the writer is doing is holding up the superiority of Jesus. And that's what we're to see and take note of. Because, because how we perceive him, right or wrong, dictates our pursuit of him. And everything that we have and all the promises that we look forward to are tied up in this one named Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, you tell us that if we seek you, 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 we can find you. You have granted us the, <laughs> the indwelling gift of your spirit within us to help us to, to understand, to, to guide us, to even empower us. I'm asking this week that you give us the ability to understand, to comprehend you speaking to us through your word. Might not get everything, but Lord, please help us to see afresh the wonder of your son, the ministry that he brings even to this day, and the power of the hope that we have in him. Thank you for the promise of Jesus. May you find us pursuing you through him. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to sing together. All of us need to get back to that again and again and again. We're going to have some prayer partners come forward. If you'd like to pray, just make it your prayer instead of Rick praying that God help me this week or redirect this area or I need to see you this way again or I need to come. I need to know Jesus like this. We invite you to come forward, speak to our prayer partners, and they'll pray with you or lead you to next steps as we sing together.